I grew up in Quebec, one of the largest French-speaking provinces in uh, Canada. And when it was time for me to go to college, I had to uh, the honor of being uh, proposed a scholarship by uh, McGill University, uh, often considered by many as one of the most prestigious universities uh, in Canada. Now, McGill is English-speaking, and at the time, I was concerned that my English wasn't strong enough and that this would affect my grades. So I ended up declining the scholarship and instead going to the Université de Montréal. Uh, which is a good institution, but most importantly for me, then, it's also French-speaking. Um, now, thankfully, my English since then has much improved, don't worry. Um, but then I, I just couldn't help but wonder whether I had made a horrible mistake. Uh, well, it turns out that this was the best decision I've ever made because uh, it's led me to join one of a handful of labs in the world that uh, were doing research on an AI technology known as artificial neural networks. So you might not have heard about artificial neural networks, but perhaps you've heard of an AI technology known as deep learning. Uh, deep learning, for instance, is behind the technology, uh, the voice recognition technology behind many devices such as uh, Siri on the iPhone or the Amazon Alexa uh, and many other voice-enabled devices. Well, at the core of deep learning is the use of artificial neural networks. So, what are artificial neural networks? They are computer programs that enable a machine to learn, and they are inspired by some of the computation that goes on in our brains, so in real neural networks. Now, consider uh, the situation of building a machine that can read and writing. Um, at the core of artificial neural networks is the artificial neuron. You see one here. Uh, and much like real neurons, artificial neurons are connected, so here, uh, we have a neuron that is connected to the pixels in that image. And uh, the job, and this is much like, in fact, real neurons that some of our neurons are connected to our retina. Uh, and the job of an artificial neuron is to detect patterns from its incoming connections. Now, much like real brains, which have many, many neurons, artificial neural networks have many artificial neurons, each doing a different thing, detecting a different type of pattern. And then finally, much like in real brains, which are organized in distinct regions, each doing a different job, so performing a different function, in deep artificial neural networks, we have multiple layers. And this is the core idea behind deep artificial neural networks, behind deep learning. Uh, and this is meant to mimic some of what we see in the brain. So, for instance, the light that hits our retina will go through multiple different regions of our brain uh, before it eventually reaches an area with neurons that understand more abstract concepts, like a tooth, for instance, a symbol. Now, this might not be surprising that to develop an artificial intelligence that we might need an artificial brain. Uh, and in fact, as far back as the 1980s and even before then, uh, there were a lot of researchers performing research on designing better artificial neural networks. But by the time that I started my PhD, uh, that activity had reduced quite a bit and there was only a handful of labs still performing research on artificial neural networks. And the reason is that then there were a lot of other different machine learning methods that seemed more successful at simple AI tasks. And in fact, the research on artificial neural networks seemed to be mostly successful with simple artificial neural networks with a single layer. So kind of like a brain, but with just one brain region. Um, and in fact, there were a lot of researchers that had essentially just given up on the artificial neural networks approach. And it wouldn't be uncommon for researchers like me to submit work at conferences and get reviews that read a little bit like this, where uh, our work would be reject rejected just for using artificial neural networks. Uh, this isn't an exact quote. I couldn't find it back in my emails. You can probably imagine I didn't care much for it and just <laughs> got rid of it. Um, and 
Yet now, fast forward 10 years, and deep learning is all the rage in academia. It's one of the most popular topic of research. In industry, deep learning technologies are being acquired at the millions of dollars. And in the media and press, it's often reported as the new AI, much like in this piece in Scientific American. So what happened? Well, what I thought I'd do today is uh, give you my perspective on the last 10 years in deep learning, that is from its emergence and how it evolved and progressed through the years. Uh, I'll talk not just about the different technology breakthroughs, but also focus a bit on how the community itself evolved and progressed. So for me, things really started in 2006. Uh, the thing that really influenced my research was this paper by Jeffrey Hinton, who you see here, from University of Toronto with uh, Simon Osindero and Ye Waite. So in that paper, Jeffrey Hinton was proposing a new approach to artificial neural networks. And what was really exciting about this work is that it achieved deep artificial neural networks that would rival some of the more standard, more popular machine learning methods of the time. So this really sparked a new hope in that the approach using artificial neural networks might actually be successful for achieving AI. This was a new hope, so it was new. So people essentially came up with a new name to refer to that type of research, and they called it deep learning. So for instance, the next year, uh, I co-organized with some of my colleagues the first deep learning workshop. It was, uh, we tried to organize it as part of the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference, which is one of the largest machine learning conferences. And uh, so we submitted a proposal for the, this workshop, but it was rejected. Uh, however, Jeffrey Hinton just wouldn't have it, so he put together the resources necessary for us to actually organize it as a parallel event. And it was a huge su success. We attracted about 10 times as many people as other official workshops that happened during the conference. So it was clear there was a lot of excitement in academia for the potential of uh, deep artificial neural networks. And then in the next three years, you started seeing an emergence of more and more papers on deep artificial neural networks, uh, referred instead under the name of deep learning. Now, there were a lot of papers published, but the progress was relatively slow. Uh, it turns out that executing artificial neural networks on regular computers is slow. And so in about 2010, several different labs figured out a way of executing artificial neural networks not on standard computers, but on uh, graphics cards, on GPUs. The same graphics cards that we use to generate crisp graphics for computer games. So this marks, for me, the first way, major way in which the deep learning community has been changing. It has become way better at exploiting computational resources. Uh, what this meant is that a deep learning research lab could essentially build its own mini supercomputer, but at a few thousand dollars. And in fact, it's that year that Jeffrey Hinton and his lab uh, produced the first results suggesting that deep learning might revolutionize speech recognition research. Uh, this came as a big surprise, and in fact, the speech research community uh, uh, had kind of uh, difficulty believing some of these results, or at least they were harder to publish initially. But now, deep learning is in a big way present in speech recognition uh, research, and it's also part of the technology like behind Siri and Alexa. Then um, in 2011, we start seeing the emergence of a lot of really good high quality softwares for uh, and libraries for supporting deep learning research, like Theano and Torch and a few others. And to me, this marks the second way in which deep learning has really been changing over the years. It now has a new dedication towards creating high quality, robust, easy to use, open and free code libraries to support deep learning research. Um, so it used to be that artificial neural networks were somewhat difficult to use and implement. Uh, but now it's actually quite easy to get started by leveraging the work of other people through these open source libraries. So deep learning community has made performing deep learning research much less like carpentry and much more like playing with Legos. In 2012, uh, Jeff Hinton, Jeff Hinton um, prepare, prepares the next revolution with deep learning, this time in computer vision. So him and his lab uh, participate to a computer vision co competition. The challenge here is to design a system that can read a photograph and identify what are the objects and animals in uh, this photograph. 
And so the results come in, and it turns out that their system totally crushes the competition and reaches uh, accuracies that were never seen before. Now this time, this breakthrough was undoubtful, and uh, in fact now in computer vision, uh, it is also a field that's uh, in large part dominated by deep learning methods right now. So in 2013, there starts being a lot of excitement around deep learning methods. And that excitement that year is about to transition to industry and in a big way. So for instance, uh, that year with my colleagues from 2007, we decided to organize another edition of the deep learning workshop. Uh, this time our proposal is accepted. Uh, and in fact, not just that, but we get folks from Facebook that reach out and say that their CEO, Mark Zuckerberg himself, actually wants to be present and participate. So let me try to convey how unusual this is. Um, organizing an academic workshop and have Mark Zuckerberg show up is kind of like organizing a party with your personal friends and then, well, look at that, Mark Zuckerberg is here. Um, <laughs> This is totally a surprise, and, and not just that. For someone like me, who used to do research initially in my PhD, and uh, I could barely get my colleagues in other topics of machine learning interested in artificial neural networks, this is almost beyond comprehension. Um, in fact, the, in the interest from industry is as high as ever, and also at that workshop, we see the first demonstration by a little-known uh, startup, DeepMind Technologies, of the first version of their system that is able to play Atari games at the level of humans. And in fact, less than a year later, uh, DeepMind was acquired by Google. Um, also that year, in 2013, the uh, International Conference on Learning Representations is uh, created. Uh, I've had the honor of uh, co-chairing that conference in the past two years. And I mention it for two reasons. The first is that this conference is now mostly known as the Deep Learning Conference. And so that means that in 2013, the community is big enough and vibrant enough that it can sustain its own conference. Uh, the other reason, and most important reason, is that this conference has a very unique reviewing model for scientific work. Uh, authors are asked to submit their work publicly right away on a website known as archive.org. Um, so now the work is accessible for everyone, and then the whole deep learning community is invited to review and criticize this work right away for everyone to see. So to me this marks the third way in which deep learning community has been changing and evolving over time. It aggressively promotes the discussion and uh, the open uh, uh, criticism of uh, deep learning results. Um, and now, in fact, this approach of as soon as you have results that can be presented, to put it on archive and then discuss it openly on social media, for instance, is uh, vastly adopted by deep learning researchers instead of waiting for the seal of approval from conferences and journals. So this is great for science. Uh, we get to iterate over ideas much more rapidly. This is not so great for scientists because any day can be a day where you discover that some other lab has executed the research idea you wanted to work on. Um, then in 2014, we start seeing uh, deep learning systems that are very good with text. So for instance, uh, we see first examples of deep learning systems uh, successfully performing machine translation, so taking in a sentence in a foreign language and producing an English translation. Uh, we also see systems that instead take in or reads an image and produces an English description of what that image is. And this is a really interesting example because that year, in a few months, four different labs proposed more or less the same idea at about exactly the same time independently. So this really illustrates how rapid innovation becomes at this time. Uh, Thanks to GPUs, to graphics cards, and thanks to really good open source software, we get to iterate and, and produce results very rapidly, and then those are communicated almost immediately for everyone to digest and, 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 and uh, dissect, laying the groundwork for the next innovation. In 2015, we start seeing deep learning systems that instead of perceiving or uh, taking as input some data and making some predictions, actually can generate or synthesize visual uh, content. So I have an example here of an algorithm, the neural style transfer algorithm based on deep learning that can read a picture, a photograph, and also a painting, and then produce a painting of that photograph using the style of the painting that was provided. 
But also, we're now seeing a lot of work on generating entirely new visual content, uh, much like in this work from <coughs> OpenAI, uh, reaching levels of realism we haven't seen before. And this goes even beyond visual content, where we're seeing, for instance, uh, uh, recent work by Google DeepMind on generating uh, uh, audio, uh, so generating speech and generating music. Uh, and also, we've seen in 2016, perhaps you've heard about this, this uh, Deep Trump Twitter bot that's powered by deep learning, where a deep learning system was trained on Donald Trump's tweets and was able to generate new tweets that might as well have come from, from him. Um, <laughs> Now, th this might make it sound easier than it was to achieve, but this is actually an impressive feat. Um, but 2016 will almost certainly be remembered as the year that Google presented their AlphaGo system, and which competed against one of the world's uh, best Go player, uh, Lisa Dahl. And uh, it won. And in fact, this came as a big surprise for many in the community. Uh, many expected it would take many more years to actually achieve this. Uh, but today, uh, AlphaGo, amongst its human peers, is uh, recognized as the second best Go player in the world. So we went from deep learning systems that can take as input an image and, and detect simple symbols in it, to deep learning systems that can both perceive and synthesize very complex content, much like uh, photographs, speech, text, or game strategies. So we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go before we reach true AI. And I'm quite optimistic that deep learning will play an important role in that quest. Uh, not just because deep learning technology is powerful, but also, and I want to leave you with this, because the deep learning community has really structured itself to facilitate innovation very quickly. It has done this by first becoming much better at exploiting computation resources using graphics card. Um, it has become better at producing tools for performing deep learning research with very high quality open source code libraries. And it has become really good at uh, discussing and uh, um, sharing information about how to do deep learning and also what is the current state of the art, what are the recent breakthroughs, and opening up the discussion to everyone. Um, we've gone a long way in these three aspects since I've done my PhD, uh, and I think we can go even further. We're starting to see on social media people even sharing preliminary results or early implementations of ideas or just ideas for other people perhaps to implement. And so this hints at a future where different research labs might actually much more openly and collectively work to uh, make progress towards AI. And then hopefully we'll reach a day where it actually doesn't matter uh, at which college you decide to go or not to go to. Thank you. <laughs>